It is 19 hours 30 all across Guyana and it is time to enter room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio alongside his co-host Mr. Leonard Gildari. This evening, their esteemed guest, former president of Guyana, Mr. Donald Ramutar. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening to you, sir. And good evening to my co-host, Leonard Gildari. Good evening to former president Donald Ramatar and ladies and gentlemen all across Guyana. Welcome to room 592 where we unleash the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet again tonight, the ending of yet another week. A week in which the goalposts keep shifting for an incumbent that seems to want to stay in power regardless of the costs. Ladies and gentlemen, as we meet tonight, I want to remind you that if one were to take the total of all the legal bills that has, has been spent and will be spent on all of these cases, that money would probably have been feeding all the needy across this country. But ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Granger, his team continue to sit in office against the will of the electorate. They continue to occupy a seat even though the people of this country spoke since March 2nd and they were kicked out of power. And today, we have Mr. Former President Donald Ramatar with us. And ladies and gentlemen, before I invite Mr. Ramatar to say a few words, I just want to uh, make a certain statement so that I can welcome him with against the backdrop. Mr. Ramatar, former president, sir, and ladies and gentlemen, there is a particular acting out of a script that seemed to have been written years ago. In 2017, Mr. Ramatar, David Granger, in a meeting in Georgia, said to PNC colleagues there that he cannot see how APNO AFC could retain power in 2020. He admitted that since 2017. However, Mr. Ramatar, after that statement, one could have seen that David Granger came home and they started to put things in place. They were upset by the unexpected no confidence motion, but they started to put things in place to rig these very elections that he thought he could not win. Mr. Ramatar, David Granger, it is alleged, well, not alleged, we all know this, David Granger went and he unilaterally appointed Patterson as the chairman of GCOM. To all the viewers and listeners out there, can you imagine if GCOM was chairman today, what would have happened? The moment Mingo did his declaration, it would have been done. Patterson would have done because that's why he was appointed. They did not expect that people would speak out against Patterson. Patterson appointed Mr. Lowenfield. Patterson appointed the secretariat as it is. And unfortunately, the good lady, Madam Claude Singh, inherited these. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a unique problem. Mr. Donald Ramatar, I bring you into this conversation, ask you for your comment here, sir, because you have lived through the dark years when Burnham would have massively rigged the Guyanese election, sir. Am I right to say that this script seems to have started before and it seems like APNU FC spend their five years in power planning to rig an election instead of improving this country? Mr. Amatar, welcome to five, room 592, sir. Thank you, and I, I, I endorse what you've said. And in fact, I believe that the conspiracy started much earlier, at the very moment that they got into the government. The very fact that they created a ministry of citizenship was the first signal. I wrote about that before in some of the articles and letters that I've been writing to the press, that, that there was no reason for that ministry to exist. It has never existed before. 
no one ever complained that in the Ministry of Home Affairs that there was too much of work to be done and so on and so forth. So I, my own view is that from the very beginning, they had planned to rig the elections to stay in power. And, and, and that, that is because they know that what they wanted to do was to use the government more to enrich themselves than to do anything for the people of, the, of this country. What is what we're seeing happening in our country now? It's not politics anymore. The PNC has the leadership of the PNC, the small cabal that runs the PNC, is now showing the true nature. This is more of a mafia than it is a political party because what they're trying to they, they, they're trying to create a huge heist against the the treasury of this country, against the assets of this country, for a very few, for a handful of people that controls the PNC. And that is what they're defending now is some of the ill got gains that they that they have had. I have heard some people um, and some articles are being written which I don't agree with, some uh, international articles and local articles. And they're blaming oil for all of this. But they, this, this is not oil to be blamed for this. This is the nature of the PNC that we're dealing with. This is a this is a gangster cabal in power that is intending that they don't care. They don't care of the consequences of this country. Imagine in a few days' time, Guyana will be at the international court to argue its case with, on, on the border issue with Venezuela. And what they're doing here, hanging on to power illegally, undemocratically and illegally, is harming us, harming every single Guyanese whether they voted for PVP or whether they voted for the AFNU AFC. And it is, it is a major damage to our society. That is an immediate consequence, you can see, of the anti-national, of the unpatriotic nature of this bunch that, that, is now, uh, in, that is now trying to stay on to power illegally, even though the people have said that they should go. You lived through, sir, you lived through um, some of the rigging that took place from 1964 to, to 1985. Mm -hmm. um, at one stage, I believe it was said that the 1985 elections were even more massively rigged than the ones before that. Um, Mr. Ramatar, would you, how would you compare this rig mm -hmm. <laughs> to the rigs? of the 1980s. My new ladies and gentlemen, we are now talking about the oil rig. And I know Mr. <laughs> Mr. Grains will say he does. What is rigging? He doesn't like this word rigging. But uh, Mr. Ramadar, how do you compare this rig? Well, they, they, they all were horrible, I could tell you. They were all horrible. The um, 1973 with the shooting of the, the uh, comrades in uh, uh, um, quarantine number 64 who were called. All they were calling for was to conk the boats to the place of coal. And they said mm -hmm. that that was impossible to be done. And, uh, and so all of, and where they, they use a lot of force in order to, um, to impose themselves on the people of this country. Mm -hmm. And the 1985, as you said, was most massively rigged. The Desmond Hoyt election was the most massively rigged election in our country. You're true, completely true of, of what you, what you said there. Um, so I think they were all bad. The difference with this one is the, is, is, is I think it took a step, a, a, a additional step, then that is trying to steal the election in the full view of the whole world, mm -hmm. is, in which they have seems to have um, lost all pretense of shame and, and all pretense of self-respect and, uh, and, and, in the full glare of the Guyanese people and of the international community, they tried to steal this election. Previous elect some of the previous elections, they did some things that were hidden, soft ballot boxes and so on and so forth. But this one was in the full glare of the public. Mr. Ramatar, as, the, for, as a former president of this country, you would have lost power to the same set that now holds on to power and not respecting the will of the electorate. Sir, if you were to 
look at what Lowen Field is doing now, mm -hmm. and knowing that some of the members of this current secretariat was there in the 2015 election, does it give, does it put any suspicion in your mind that a narrow loss of the PDP in 2015 then might have been not a loss at the poll, but some machinations? Well, I've said that over and over openly and publicly that I, that I'm convinced that the 2015 elections were also rigged, not as massively as this one, but it was also um, rigged in 2015. The same low in field, who was the chief elections officer, that was before, I think, I think just before he really became a rogue, that he, he had said to the elections commission when they were asking him to announce the election, he had said then that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't announce these elections because he found fictitious statements of poll. And the elections commissioners, the commission told him, well, announce the box that you are confident with. And he put aside 400 boxes. And then the next day, without anything changing, even though we had meetings with the, with the commission, with Suraj Bali and all of them, and they promised to come back 22 boxes. They never did. And they went ahead and, and um, announced the elections. By then, Lowenfield was compromised completely because his, the steps that he took after, if he thought the elections were free and fair, why did he go to the extent of and he should have been very happy to have an audit of that election and and to try to facilitate the the uh, elections petition that we've had but he did everything to stop it he contested it it was amazing to see him contesting an election and and it was very clearly said to me that he became compromised and mm -hmm. he um began to do and now it's more because you know that you heard about um all the lands that he have been given since the, over the last five years that he has acquired uh, this government has passed a lot of land and so forth to him and i you know i heard that he's buying up a lot of properties in the, in the village that he came from on the current scene mm -hmm. so i think oh. he is he has compromised himself tremendously but you mentioned something extremely interesting there mr ramadar leonard Mm -hmm. Former president has said just now something that is akin to what has happened again. He said that in the 2015 elections, this same gentleman had wanted to burn away over 400 boxes. And he ended up magically bringing them back in, but only burn away enough, which was, uh, according to Mr. Ramatar, about 20 odd boxes um, that gave the victory to APNU AFC. And it's like the same script again, Mr. Ramatar. Did I say that? Uh, did I represent it well there, sir? No, I think it's a little bit different. <laughs> Please correct uh, I it. Think he was, correct. I think, I think at, the, at the beginning he was trying to do something proper. And mm -hmm. he put aside 400 boxes which he thought was compromised. Okay. What happened between that night and the next day when he announced the election? I think it's over that period of time he became compromised. And he didn't bother... To, to, uh, he announced the election mm -hmm. despite the fact that he himself said that there were 400 fictitious statements of poll. Mm -hmm. So, Leonard, there is a so, thread. I, that I, I, and I think from then on, he became a rogue and he, he became part of the AFA up new plot. Um, so, he probably resigned himself that he will just uh, collaborate with them to, and, and probably see what he could get out of it, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And to, to do the things that he's done now. What was the story, for, if, I may, if I may, um, uh, Mr. President, what is the story behind those fake statements of polls that would have surfaced in 2015? Well, as I said, it was Lewin Field who, who first brought that to the attention of the, um, of the Elections Commission, the commissioners at, at, the, at the meeting of the Elections Commission. And he said that there were a lot of Fictitious statements of poll. Um, so, and he couldn't call the election at, at that point in time. He couldn't call it then, he said. And, mm -hmm. but as I, I, I mentioned, he, he, he decided to go ahead and, and uh, announce the election. Because if I remember well, at that mm -hmm. time, Leonard, mm -hmm. Granger himself was on air demanding 
Release your statement of pause. Release your statement of pause. Yeah. You remember that video, Leonard? Yeah, and it was actually, yeah, they, they were actually released. I, some of, I think some of the statements of poll that were released were probably fictitious statements of poll as well. Wow. That they released to them. Have you ever mm -hmm. thought back, uh, uh, sir, as to how many votes would have probably been fraudulent in the 2015 elections? I never... Um, I never, I had, I had hoped that these things would have come out at the uh, elections petition, which was never heard, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is a, a, also a, an indictment on our judiciary as well. And then the elections petition was never called. Um, in all, we, our elections were held before the Trinidad election and before the elections in Kenya in 2015. And both those elections had election petition. The one in Trinidad was heard and it was lost. The one in Kenya was won, the opposition won, and they had to have a re-election. The, the judge ordered a re-election. And up to now, the 2015 elections petition in Guyana cannot be heard. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Ramatar, Guyanese Gain, in 2015, and that uh, change of, of government, they, a lot of Guyanese uh, seem to have been attracted to the big tent politics that APNU AFC had offered and they saw that it meant a lot of people were coming together under one big tent. I don't think anybody foresaw that notwithstanding the big tent politics, that Granger would have taken absolute control. Well, the PNC would have taken absolute control of the parliament. It took two years for a guy needs to see when Granger was appointing his former uh, army persons in all top positions and PNC persons were all over and you remember that famous statement from Wally Lawrence and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think from the very outset they started to dismiss um, a lot of people who, who um, they, and in order to put in people who would, two things they started to, to put in, they started to put in people who helped them facilitate them to rig elections and facilitate the massive corruption that has taken place over the last five years. Um, I mean, some ministers um, used to live extremely modestly. Now they have three and four mansions all over the place, and they have they, they, the wealth that they have is extraordinary. Up to today, I, I heard that, um, today or yesterday, I heard that um, some of the work that is being done at the at this new hospital that they're building, at the uh, converting the hotel into mm -hmm. a hospital. I heard one of the men who's who one of the big contractors who's there doing a lot of the work there, um, millions of dollars in work he has. His his mother-in-law is the PS of the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. So um, there's and, a lot of this type of and there, it, there seems to be in this period, even though they conventionally the government should not be doing these things, there seems to be a mad rush as much as possible to hand out. I saw in the paper. BK got some big contracts mm -hmm. and and all of these things are happening and, and, and there seems to be a massive raid on the treasury going on right now. Well, there is no money in the treasury. Mr. Ramatar, I want to come back to something that uh, would have happened under your watch. Under your watch, mm -hmm. um, you had pushed and your government would have pushed the creation of a specialty hospital. And I think your the bill, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this carefully. The PPPC had propositioned a specialty hospital. The bill, I think the building of it, so when I say bill, that is what I meant. The expense of it would have been above a billion Guyana dollars. It was about uh, just over half a billion for startup. Um, however, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, that was to build from scratch, to build from maiden ground right up. It was not to refurbish. Mr. Ramatar, that program would have been scrapped. I think the combined opposition would have voted that program to a dollar and virtually killed it. What went through former President Ramatar's mind when you see a refurbishing project mm -hmm. that will be much more, I think conservative figures are that it would meet about $3 billion to complete that facility at Ocean View? Um, well, as you mentioned in your opening remarks that I've been around for a while, mm -hmm. so not very much surprised me with this, with this group that is running the country. They are, they, these people, as I said, are proving to be not politicians, but mafia type operators. And their main purpose is, is very clear. I mean, it is so transparent now that their main purpose is, has nothing to do with development. 
their main purpose has to do with with um, with um, getting themselves rich. That same project that you spoke about, um, it really started on the former president Jack Dio, and then we had a lot of problems with the contractor, and we took the contractor to court, and we got judgment against him, and we seized a lot of steel and materials that he had to repay some of them. It was enough to repay some of the money that we had advanced him. As soon as the government changed, in a matter of days, that, that whole container was handed over to BK and Tiwari. And, and mm -hmm. therefore, the government got nothing. And they scrapped the whole, uh, they scrapped the whole, they had voted against it. But I think in Parliament, we had passed it by a very slim majority because one of their um, MPs got sick and wasn't there to vote. And we got it passed by a one, one vote, but in the, and we would have moved ahead with it. And that is why we had taken the matter to, to the court. But um, but when right. they got in government, they scrapped it. They scrapped it, yeah. And, and, and Mr. Yeah, go on. Good, uh, sorry for that. Jerry Govaya, Captain Jerry Govaya would have been on this program a couple of weeks back, and he always keeps telling the story about the private sector's role in your conceding back in 2015, uh, Mr. President. Could you tell us what the story there? I think the private sector was in your room, he says, uh, in your office at the Ministry of the Presidency there. And they would have told you a couple of things. I think they had a meeting with you, and then it was Ramesh Prasad, then as a chairperson, would have stood up and says, Mr. President, I think based on the figures, uh, you guys appear to have lost the elections. And I think uh, they walked out. But uh, after that, you would have conceded, knowing that you probably would have won the election because something went wrong with the elections. At what point in time did you decide to concede? Um, it is true that the private sector came to me and, and, and told me to um, that they think I should concede the election. I explained to them. I showed them also all the things that I've had, the boxes that I've had. And I and I showed them the uh, information that was in my possession that some of these things were wrong. I told them about the the, the boxes that low and field for the site, and I thought that the elections were rigged. But they seem to have been very convinced that uh, that we had lost that the PVP Civic had lost the election, and they were asking me to concede. I I did not concede because they didn't because GCOM did not GCOM did not. Uh, fulfill the agreement that they had with me to come at least. I asked them even to come five boxes. And if I'm wrong, because I didn't want to hold up the election, then if I'm wrong, that I will concede the election. And then it was Soros Bali who said 22 boxes wouldn't take us an hour to come. And we will come all 22 boxes. And which he never did. So, but what, but what I did, I know what um, some of these things can, the impact and the harm it can do to our country. So when the Elections Commission announced the elections, even though I was convinced that it was rigged, I thought that it was more important for our country to move forward than to, for me to, to, um, to fight to just stay in power like that. Like that. And I believe at that point in time that um, most people felt I, I was probably in a minority in thinking that the elections were rigged. Um, and and being convinced that the election was rigged. But I did not want to harm the development of our country. I did not want to create an atmosphere in you know, to divide the people in our country and, and so forth. So I, when the election result was, was announced, I immediately uh, had a meeting with the, the last meeting with my cabinet. And I told them, all the ministers, that they should cooperate and to have a smooth transition that most important is the welfare of the people of the country. And, and we set up a small team, a small body, to work with the AFNU ASC to have a smooth transition to, towards a new government and not to have any type of disruption. And I asked my ministers at that last meeting to make themselves available for any, any information or questions that they will have and to pass over some of the unfinished business that we were doing, some of the things that we had in place, to pass it over to them. So hopefully, I thought that they would have continued with many of the things that we've had, yeah. and um, and that is how that that is how I that is how our government operated with, with in that in that last meeting that we had with the cabinet, 
Um, those, those were the final instructions. I asked all of them to return their cars and whatever other property that they have. I even told some of, I even told them, I said, this, these people, because I know them a long time, I said, these people that, that is coming into government now are very, very vindictive people. So you, even if you have telephone for the government, hand it in back, back to them and don't keep anything, any of government property, which we right. have to keep. And a quick uh, clarification there uh, for those who probably don't know, in terms of the timeline for when elections were held to the time of declaration to the time of when you would have met with your cabinet to give them certain instructions, could you give us a little idea as to how that went in terms of days, weeks, maybe? Immediately, immediately uh, the, the, the day that the elections were announced, um, we immediately handed over, began to hand over things to, to, to the government. We didn't stay. And I, I could tell you this, I didn't even spend another night in State House. I packed and came home to my to my own home in a right. good for Washington. We were, we, we, I didn't sleep a single night in the State House when I was not president. I want to take you back to that time again. Mm -hmm. Viewers and listeners, it is important that we remember some of these things. In fact, Mr. Ramatar, when he was president, he and I, we didn't see eye to eye. I, I was, I had opposed a lot of the initiatives <laughs> and and stuff like that. There I is. Hope you, I hope you see your folly now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not a folly. We learn as we go by. But sir, um, in during your tenure, I remember, and ladies and gentlemen, I remember that we had all spoken out when Roger Luncheon as head of the presidential secretariat then, secre uh, cabinet secretary, had appeared on the PPP's list, their slate, going into the 2015 election, and we all spoke out against it. And the, the gentleman immediately, I think he resigned. However, in 2020, we saw coming up to the 2020 elections, uh, Harmon, Joe Harmon had retained his position, and it is only when people objected and vehemently objected to him being on the slate and still be in the position that some change, but though the change happened very late. Sir, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, the hypocrisy is real, isn't it? A lot of the things that the APNU AFC criticized and attacked your government for they end up doing that and even worse. Well, yes. I mean, there's a lot of things that they, 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 a lot of things have been circulated. Some of the speeches of uh, Mr. Granger that he spoke about uh, before the elections, when I, when I legally, within the constitutional rights, when I prorogued the parliament, he was speaking about um, have to give up and have to do that and so forth, although it was le all legally done. And here they are doing all kind of illegal things and, um, and, and seems to trying to find ways to justify it. Right. So um, you're right, the hypocrisy, it, 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 it is so much, it is so much that it is uh, it's more a slap in our faces. Yeah. It's a it slap in our faces. More, more than a slap in our faces. It is a disgrace to our country what is taking place. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is, it is, um, these are people, as I said, that are, they have demonstrated that they have no patriotism, no nationalism. How could they humiliate our country like this to, to what, what they're doing? The whole war against them. Just, just, just today, again, the United States government has over and over again come out. They, they, the senators across the aisle, are, um, uh, Republican and that they are here illegally. All the governments, most of the, gov the governments in the Caribbean and the governments of the United States, Canada, Denmark, uh, the European Union, UK, all of them are saying that they, and, but, and, these, and, and then they are cursing these people out in mm -hmm. all kind of vile way that they are attacking people. Look at the way they have been attacking the chairman of CARICOM. And I think for, I, I think the, the step that CARICOM has taken, the stand that CARICOM has taken, all of us in the Caribbean should be extremely proud of the quality of leadership 
that me a month is given the curriculum right now. And, um, and, it, and it was a very bold, and it tells you that CARICOM will no longer tolerate this type of nonsense that, is, that, that the PNC wants to get along with here. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, so Mr. I Robert, think that it is, it, it's a shame. It, 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 it is probably one of the most damaging people, not only for Guyana, but for the region, because we're part of CARICOM. And CARICOM themselves are embarrassed that so, uh, one of their member states will be behaving in this in this um, right. totally undemocratic. I would even go so far to say in this time, in this 21st century, it is a be almost an uncivilized type of behavior. That you see. Correct. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just wish to remind you all, and here, is, here I go, I just stole the thunder away from my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari. This was supposed to be his part to do, you know, but, you know, we're brothers. Uh, today, this evening, I think you're trying to fact, set me up there. Uh, <laughs> this evening, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Ramata referred to it just now. Um, three of the senators uh, from both sides of the aisle, from the Republicans and Democrats, have asked the authorities in Guyana to begin a democratic transition of power. Let me repeat the senators have asked the authorities in Guyana to begin a democratic transition of power. Mr. Ramatar, I don't know how else, what other words one could say to persons who have lost their ability to even feel an iota of embarrassment. <laughs> what other words yeah, can I people say? Well, I think it, the, the, the logical thing to go is follow the money. So they, they, that's a normal statement I think you auditors mm -hmm. um, like to use. Follow the money. This is a, this, this, this is not, I mean, you, they can't, you can't say that they're defending national interests. They're not defending the good name of the country. In fact, they're, they're throwing it down the sewer, they are, uh, the good name, name of Guyana. Therefore, they are defending self-interest here. Correct. Tremendous self-interest that, that, they, that they, they are defending. Let's talk, a little bit, let's talk a little bit about the inner workings of, of government and good governance. You mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned the Ministry of Citizenship. Does Mr. Ramatar, former president, when you saw the creation of the Ministry of Citizenship, did it, was it in your thought, uh, or am I wrong to say that the Ministry of Citizenship was created for two purposes? One, well, three. One was to facilitate a potential rigging of these elections. Two was to uh, basically dilute whatever powers would have gone to, the, to, to Ramzutan. It was pulling a rug out from Ramzutan's feet, and three was to find a place for for the minister. What are your thoughts to those um, things, sir? Yeah, yes, and I think also because they they put the, the PNC put the, their man in that position, they had to give Ramzutan something. But as you rightly said, that that's probably probably at that early stage, they didn't totally trust him. But no, I think he has he has gone over completely. Um, he and Nagamoto seem to have lost all all shame. They, they seem to have lost all all self respect. And some of the things that they used to talk about about defending democracy and so forth, they have revealed themselves that they for for what they really are. And um and so you're right. I think you're right about those things. But I also think that it was to give them the control. Of, of the birth certificates, of ID cards, uh, um, have something to do with these type of things. And I think my own view is that the main purpose was to prepare the rigging of election. I believe strongly, this is my personal view, I believe strongly that the no confidence motion in 2018, December 2018, did put a, put a, 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 a spoke in the wheel. And, and, and upset their plans, and, and maybe because of that, they didn't get a chance. That is one of the reasons they were fighting to have house to house campaign, house to house registration, and so forth, because that is when that, that plan would have kicked in to, um, to rig the list mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to do no massive rigging of the election. 
if they had if they had gotten opportunity to rig the list and they didn't have that opportunity because of the new confidence motion they never they they, they couldn't uh, go on and they couldn't really discredit the list because the list was a, a constantly being updated every six months and the list itself was very very clean and very uh, uh, correct good, you know? so i i think that the, Mm-hmm. I think the main the main purpose in my view, um, in my view, the main purpose was to use it to to rig the election, which which the no confidence motion snatched away from them. So you mentioned two names there. You mentioned Mr. Kemal Grandstan and Moses Nagmoto. Those mm-hmm. both of these men were your buddies. They mm-hmm. were your comrades in arms. They were your colleagues. Um, it is one of them, as of last week or week before, accused you, accused you in an attack. And I will tell you what was the attack, and you can comment on it if you don't mind, sir. They attacked you that you had hired some firm, and the purpose for which you hired this Cambridge Analytica was for, for them to create advertisements about Mandir's and afro guyanese and indo guyanese What's your comment to that, sir? Well, I could ask you, have you ever seen such advertisements? <laughs> I haven't. Platform. I haven't. I haven't and, seen. And secondly, um, I could tell you very clearly that Cambridge Analytica very emphatically had absolutely nothing to do with our elections campaign. They were not involved mm-hmm. in our elections campaign. Um, they were totally not involved in 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 the mm-hmm. elections campaign that we've had. So I I, that, I right. can put that to rest immediately. But but I'm surprised that Nagamutu has been making this statement when he himself I don't know if he 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 knows that this PNC government paid millions to a company they call themselves the CT Group, Cosby Tech, Cosby Tech Store, yes, Tech Store yes. Group. Millions of dollars they paid paid to them. Uh, since 2019, they had them um, working here. They had a meeting in State House. Mm-hmm. Where Nagamutu and uh, and Ramjatan were present at, at that meeting as well. And and they at the end, I think they uh, so coming to the end. I understand that uh, they didn't want to pay some some more money, and they had some disagreements. So what Mark Curtin uh, and the and the top cabal of the PNC was there. So for Nagamutu to making that statement after he has been involved in something like this shows the character uh, or how, 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 how much he has degenerated. And, and, I, and I would say no on reflection that a lot of his um, posture in the past, it is very clear now that the posture that he adopted in the past, were, he, was, he, he was not sincere about a lot of the things that, that uh, he was doing. For a man to now be part of what is happening here, when the nation is being raped, and when the, the, the rights of our, the most fundamental rights of our people and democratic society is now being uh, snatched away in such a crude fashion, and Nagamutu uh, is now part and part of that, defending that, protecting that with all kind of frivolous arguments, all kind of frivolous arguments, and attacking people, attacking people who has come to the de- who has come in support of the Guyanese people to try to prevent the the, the destruction of democracy in our country. So I, I think he has he has absolutely no any credibility. He has no credibility left at all in him, and he well, is. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, about uh, Mr. Nakamoto from the following perspective, and let me repeat. Um, you know, let me throw it at you. They were your buddies, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. You guys worked together, and uh, I believe well, you. Said, Nagamutu, yeah. yeah, and you you would have spent a lot of years together. But it was Nagamutu that wrote. Well, not wrote, but he compiled mm. some books on behalf of the People's Progressive Party. One I have in front of me here: the mm. Three Trials Three of Arnold Rampasad. Yeah, he did and, a good job. Yeah, and in that book, ladies and gentlemen, if you have never read The Three Trials of Arnold Rampasad, please get your hands on it. If you don't have a copy, we'll try to make it available, mm-hmm. providing the People's Progressive Party can give us the rights to release copies of it. Sure, uh, I, but I, I don't think, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I'm not 
I don't speak anymore on behalf of the PVP. The PVP has its general secretary and so forth. I'm still a member of the executive, but I don't think anyone will object to me telling you here in the public, you go straight ahead and circulate the book as wide as we as possible. Okay. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is Moses Nagamuto that compiled the three trials of Arnold Rampasad, a book that, when you read it, it's a booklet actually, not too big, but when you read it, it, it outlines a lot of the rigging that took place during the 1970s, especially on and around the 1973 election. And there's another book too that speaks to the 1973 elections itself. Um, yeah. and, and so, Mr. Ramatar, here is a, a gentleman that has, has probably, he has gotten to where he wanted. He wanted to be in a seat of power. Under the PPPC, he probably saw that he was never going to get there. And so he changed seats. And the man who spoke against rigging is now involved in rigging, would you say? Yes, he's fully, I mean, it is, it is, um, it is, it is, it is sad, but, but, uh, to see his evolution, or no, sorry, maybe evolution is the wrong word, his degeneration, that he has degenerated uh, completely. And that is why I question, I mean, when we were buddies and we had all kind of ideals of killing this, our society and so forth, I question his sincerity about it, his talk about it. I question how sincere he was when he was speaking about the freedom and fighting for freedom of our people. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and because how could you move from that position to now being in this position here and defending what is going on in the face of, as I said, everybody saw what was happening. It's glare, it's not something that was hidden that you can defend. The world saw what was happening, and here is that Mutu, um, because he, he has, um, it shows that he has no conviction, really no conviction. But, but a lot of the people, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, history will, will certainly judge all of us. The WPA, mm -hmm. um, I think there would have been discussions, am I wrong, sir? There might have been discussions in the past between the WPA and the PPP. Um, and there would have been discussions uh, between yourself and other parties, uh, well, you meaning the PPP and other parties. Um, but a lot of these people would have left, and they are now in bed with the PNC, the same PNC that you guys have fought your entire life against. It is amazing. I mean, as I said, it's very, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the WPA, of course, was at its highest point when Walter Rodney was there, and all of us acknowledge the role that Rodney played. He was a, he was a genuine leader. He really was trying to fight for change in our society. But the people that were with him, you, you know, when you look at the people, their positions now with him, you cannot be surprised that he was assassinated. Because these people obviously did not have this conviction. He was probably dragging them along with him because of the of his own personality, his charisma, the, uh, and so on and so forth. But they obviously to, to swing the way they have they have swung, and to now to be supporting the same body of people who were involved in the assassination of of, of Walter. Many of them, many of them in government had very top and senior positions in the army. And and the army, we know that this is one of the things that was used in the murder of Walter Rodney was the army, the police, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so forth. And and the, these people who claim to have loved Rodney and, 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 pro, and pro, promote Rodney and so forth, to find themselves in this position, uh, to me, it's very, very hard for me to, to really comprehend that kind right. of of, of, of metamorphosis. But, but, but let's, let's spend a, se a minute, if you don't mind, sir. Under your watch, I believe the commission of inquiry into Walter Rodney's assassination mm -hmm. would have probably concluded, um, but the report uh, would have never been tabled at the National Assembly. Was that it because there was a transition of government or? 
No, it was stable. I think it was okay. stable, but it was stable. For one, one, what, what had happened to it? It was um, the, 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 the commission did a lot of work, enough work to give them enough evidence to make conclusion, but they didn't actually conclude all of their work. They didn't. Uh, they were still people who they wanted to take testimony from. Mm -hmm. But I think they had accumulated enough evidence in order to, uh, and they did subsequently, um, it was laid in the parliament subsequently, but what has happened, it was played down completely by the WPA themselves. They have, they have never even spoken about it uh, publicly, and it was completely um, tried to play it down. So, so probably the WPA killed Wateradi the second time around? I, I said that of uh, of them because I remember Rupert Ryan in a pub in a in a in a television program that they had. He said that uh, they were accumulating weapons to overthrow the Bonham regime, and I think they said that because they had to create a platform for their crossing over to the PNC and to justify Bonham's uh, assassination of Walter Rodney. Mm. That so is, I think, and a, and, a, and a lot of them, uh, obviously, were not clearly were not moved by the same sentiment and by the same philosophical position of Walter Rodney, and they 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 degenerated themselves. But sir, you had employed people to to um, document. The, yeah, I think uh, that document. I think they did it, but I I. I um, I think they are probably going to release some of those. They're, they're, that will come out. But the report is there, there too, the other documentary thing there. And okay. the other, I expect that the other work that was done should be made public anytime. Else. Okay. And what Great. would be your comments, sir, on the future of the Alliance for Change? I don't know if they're, they're, they are. I think the Alliance for Change is, is really. Um, on the way out, actually, um, they are substantially being. Uh, there is now completely exposed. They got some type of popularity because places like Kaicho News wrongfully attacked the PVP and started to talk a lot about corruption, and um, they 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 um, actually capitalized on some of that part. But fortunately for us that the PNC has vindicated all of us by their holding of 50 or so forensic audits where they spent hundreds of millions of dollars and found nothing. Uh, but still they continue with the um, with the thing. But the, the culture news played a, a big part in, um, in, in helping them to grow because people believe the kind of reputation of that nonsense that that not true without foundation and they keep repeating these things um is what made some of the changes that took place but people now are are, are they've, they've seen what what has happened um, let us let us stick to the go back to the sorry leonard let's yes. let's go back to the inquiry a little bit sir what would you say might be if you can or, or we'll probably have to have another session where we can bring the notes maybe but what would you say stuck out in your mind uh, for, the, for, for one or two of the highlights of that inquiry and, and or the conclusions? Well, to, to me, on, on a general area was the cold-blooded way. Uh, as I said, all of what we're seeing now, happening here now, has always been there. And the murder of Walter Rodney was like because Walter Rodney was threatening the, 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 the power of the cabal, the small cabal that is running things there, the, the leadership of the PNC, not more than 20 or 30 people that have been enriching themselves at the expense of the Guyanese people. And so, so the shocking thing to, to, to me was the cold blooded way that. They, uh, they, and the systematic way that they went about to um, assassinate the man for his own strong conviction and for the fact that he was fighting. So I think he, he was, he was um, to use Walter Rodney, to use Bob Marley's word, he was, fighting, he was encouraging people to liberate themselves from the mental slavery that the PNC had some of them. Mm -hmm. 
let's 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 just if you don't mind going back to your years as president sir what stands out for you um maybe foremost in your mind as might have been one of the things that you would say you know i did that and proud of that that kind of thing that uh, you then you realize that I was only in government for I was only president for three and a half years, mm-hmm. and I saw my my presidency as continuing the work that the PPP Civic has been doing from 1992, mm-hmm. continue the good work. I supported all of the projects that the PPP had. I thought the Amila Falls of, that if we had gotten that, we would have been in a far better position today. The, the Marius Hotel was constructed mainly, it, it started on the uh, former president last year, but it was constructed on my time. I think that was extremely important and it has been proving its worth um, as the, a, good, a good center. We have developed a lot of those areas. And under my three years, um, I would say that we have distributed more house love than any other three year period in the history of this country, including the 23 years history of the of the PDP. And that also, some credit for that will also go to uh, Irfan Ali, who was heading the ministry and showed that he has great capacity to get things done. He has uh, a lot of capacity to work. He's a hard worker. He ran more than one ministry. And um, I remember I was going to uh, appoint uh, another minister to help to run tourism, and the whole tourist authority came to me and asked me to, um, to keep here for Ali day because of how receptive he was with them and, and under his guidance of that ministry, how the tourism sector was growing. So I, what I would say is my great achievement that I'm proud of, that we kept the economy going at the period of time when, when I got into the government, it was height of the international financial and economic crisis in the world, many countries in the Caribbean could not pay wages and salaries. Many countries in the United States, were, uh, people were losing their jobs in the millions. Mm-hmm. Banks were closing up and so forth. And we, under the, uh, in that period of time, we were actually, um, our country, our economy was growing at a steady rate of 4.5% average over the period mm-hmm. of time. And, and we continue to, we kept it growing because in the light of the worst financial and economic crisis in the world, and when all of our, when a lot of our trade and economic relations internationally was tied with many of the countries that were going through the difficulties, the fact that we were able to do it was, was for me a very, and we did it also in the right. face of tremendous opposition because we didn't have of the one-seat minority. To show you how vindictive these people were, the, the, the anti-money laundering bill was in place before I got into the government. That every time it needed to be renewed, they go to parliament to renew it. I remember the, that. They voted for it when they didn't have the majority. I remember but the moment that. they got the one-seat majority, they used it to try to damage the very heart of our economy, because the financial sector is, the, is at the very heart of your economy. And they would, they, it was a deliberate attempt to damage the economy of the country. Um, and, so, and that was their purpose. They saw but the, I, the I remember that. I remember the games that were played with the anti-money laundering laws. And I also remember, and Guyanese must remember, that the games that were played were the local government elections because right. it is the same APNU AFC when they were in opposition they stalled and stalled and stalled and and uh, you know they end up blaming people oh, for I, not I, holding I, I kept reminding people of that because i remember that the pvp was ready to go to elections when, when after all that was needed to be done was done with we couldn't hold local government election before 2005 because of the new constitution things that we were writing in the constitution. But when we were ready, it was Robert Corbyn who asked Barrett Dagdio not to hold a local government election. And he conceded and now they're forcing us that we didn't hold local government election. But sir, under me, I must say that I would have, on. under me, I did promise in the campaign that I would hold local government election. 
and I was ready to hold the local government election. <laughs> but how did it, but the moment I had a one seat, my, my, when I had a minority in the parliament, I was anticipating every year that these people would bring a no confidence motion against me. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and even when I spoke, the, the one of the last meetings I've had with uh, no de facto president uh, Granger, um, we spoke about the local government election. So I told him that I'm ready to hold it, but are you going to assure me that you're not going to vote for this no confidence motion? He said he can't give me that assurance because he gave his commitment to the AFC to vote. So I said, well, well, how can I call a local government election if this is the position that you have? Right. So he raised but, it to me when we met, and, mm -hmm. and I told him that. So to the Guyanese brothers and sisters, viewers and listeners out there, uh, we, we have asked Mr. Ramatar here to give us the perspective because we need to keep in mind how the script keep on repeating itself. Ladies and gentlemen, remember that in 2015 and thereabouts, it was APNO AFC that had a majority in government. The PPPC was a minority, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in opposition. Uh, the PPPC had a minority government. And so the same APNO AFC had voted for Chronicle, NCN, they voted for a dollar for the budget, so because they wanted to defund the Chronicle. And today, the Guyana Chronicle has become the Guyana Rag. Now, what you find happening also, ladies and gentlemen, it is the same Granger and uh, the AFC team that were in opposition then, that had played the games calling for, for the PPPC to, to be accountable and transparent on a number of things. And immediately when they got into office, they played on the other foot. Mr. Romatar, forgetting the division in politics, sir, forgetting that APNU AFC is in power, if we forget their existence for a minute, I want to come at you with something. I believe that the PPPC were not transparent enough in, in releasing adequate information. So, for example, the, uh, the hydroelectric project or the specialty hospital. What I feel that you guys comment on this, uh, it, the, the opinion is that you guys hid the feasibility studies and, and you sent out your people to beat people on the head to accept this project. And in that way, people were not, the, the intelligentsia, the people, the analysts and so forth, were not fully on board because they didn't have the background information. Your comment, sir? Um, that, is, that is probably partly true. Um, maybe I, what I would say is not that we didn't, um, not that we didn't, uh, not that we were not transparent, but I believe that we didn't, we didn't push enough. Maybe we should have, put, we should have been more consistent. Because from the moment you talk about it, after two days, they came back with the same old thing, same old again, and keep repeating all the time. Goebbels like some of these propaganda war. But I'm glad because the point I wanted to make to you, because some mm -hmm. people are saying that about inclusiveness. I invited uh, the APNU and the AFC to my office, and I had Winston Brassington, and Ashni Singh and Rope Seben with me. And we give the AFC and the, and the PNC a complete, complete uh, information on the, on the hydropower station. Every single thing we give. We give them all the documents. Even documents that were commercially sensitive. We, I asked them to, well, these are commercial stuff, things that have not for these things, but I'm, I'm giving it to you to see. I had more than two meetings, two meetings I had with them so where, where they had full briefing on this matter. They, and I even told them that I, if they had any questions, I, when I, after I have given them all the documents, I said, you can take these documents to your specialists, to your technical people or people who you have faith in. And if you have any, any questions, I will ask my people to summon another meeting and we will answer you. They never came back to me. They asked that for them to visit the, uh, the hydro power site. We did that. 
We took the army helicopter, and at the same time, we gave them a tour of what we were doing at the airport, the new airport that we were building. They are gone, they're going to do another refurbish stuff there, and we're not getting a new airport. And more, far, double the amount of money for the new airport again that they have there. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, we took them to look at that, and we took them to have Amaila Falls, flew them there to see the thing. And I thought that they, they would have gone ahead with it. Lo and behold, they voted against it. Um, and that was one instance. There was another instance where we had consultation with them. People talk about consultation and involving. I remember the 2012 budget. I was so elated when we had a, uh, my meeting with them to talk about the budget and what was going on and what we can do. And they asked me that uh, if I could increase the pension, the old age pension, a little bit more. And I said, sure. And in the, in the parliament, um, I think it was coming Sam Hines who, uh, no, it was Ashley who went and, and, and announced that we are moving ahead. And we on, he, he mentioned publicly in the parliament that yes, it was the, the, on the request of the uh, opposition leader in a meeting with me that we agreed that we would increase the old age pension and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then we agreed that what was happening in Linden with the electricity question was a little bit of, uh, of unfair to the rest of the nation and that we would gradually bring it back into operation. They agreed with me. And then Commissioner Sam Hines wrote his presentation to the National Assembly, showed it to Granger, who was in the opposition leader at the time, and together with Ruth Narine, they looked at it, and they said it was all right. When Sam read it out, lo and behold, before the day was over, it was like, what was the biblical thing? Before the cock crowed twice, <laughs> thou shalt deny me thrice. That is what happened. That is what happened. So when you right. talk about all of these inclusiveness and working together, it is very difficult to work with people who are so unprincipled. Mm -hmm. Extremely difficult to, to, to do that because we have been doing everything and trying to involve them. Look, when Cherry Dragon came into the government in 1992, one of the first thing he did try to do was to set up the, the Ethnic Relations Commission and put somebody of the quality of Bishop George to head it. The PNC opposed it. Opposed it and course up Bishop George and, 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 and all of that and, and um, try to sabotage the work of the Ethnic Relations Commission. Because and they did that. They don't want to have a proper function in the Ethnic Relations Commission because of what the, the, the politics is fundamentally based on trying to mislead afro guyanese that the PPP civic government is, is anti afro guyanese So well, they, yeah. they, uh, what I wanted to say is that I do know, I do know that we have been trying to work with them, not only me, but previous PVP civic government bent over backward to involve the PNC opposition, PNC, PNC reform, APNU, to try to let us work together. And in every single stage, we were sabotaged. Right there. Right. Now, what would I you say? Go ahead. I have a couple of quick questions you have for the good yeah. president. 2015, there were some talks that uh, leading into the elections that the U.S. would have told Guyana not to say anything about uh, the discovery of oil. Could you walk us through that? What was the timeline? Did we know before the election that there was oil or after the election? I, 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 dealt, I dealt with that with you. Right, right. right. But some people are still asking here. That uh, one of the programs that you had. Yes. And, I, and, and in fact, this is a matter that is in court to some extent, mm -hmm. where I said very clearly, I was told that there is strong, uh, what is the word? I'll try to remember the exact word. Indications, that used. maybe. There were strong indications um, that there would possibly be some, they, they, they didn't view the word oil that was there. But they, they never said to me before election that, that uh, oil was discovered there. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I, uh, and I mentioned that on more than one occasion. So it was exploration I, rather than. I, uh, I made I made a, a public statement. I had a press statement mm -hmm. in that regard, and uh, and I and I sent it out to the media publicly on, on that. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead, Lana. Yes, uh, pardon me, there, uh, my my good uh, host. Um, 
So with regard to we, we see comparisons being drawn uh, right now, CARICOM, we, we could list them on one hand hand or two hands. We have CARICOM, Commonwealth, OAS, CARTA Center, the ABC in EU countries, every everybody. It seems as if the whole world has come down again or on the coalition to have them do things according to the law and maybe concede according to the recount or uh, make sure that they adhere to the recount the results. Uh, what would you say to critics who would draw a uh, parallel between uh, uh, Priya Manikchan and Gail Teixeira going to the ambassador's house on uh, July the 4th and to the criticisms now that would be coming against the uh, diplomats in Guyana? Um, I would say that it's, a, it's totally different. It's a totally different thing. I thought and I'll tell you very frankly, I thought that the then ambassador of the United States was overreaching in some ways, right, of some of the things that he, he was saying. Um, I was out of the country, actually, when this happened. And, um, and I thought that he was, um, I, I think that was the feeling in, in our cabinet a lot of the time that some of the comments that he was making and sometimes we feel without any basis and so forth that, and we we were answering him. We were answering him to defend our country and our country's integrity. We were not mm -hmm. trying to steal any elections. We were not trying to do anything undemocratic. We were not breaking any laws. We were not violating any constitution or any any to any uh, anything of that nature. So it's, a, it, it, it's a bad. It was vastly different. It's a vastly different type of situation um, um, than, than, than now. Um, the, the Americans and the British and the Canadians and the European Union and all of that are standing up in support of our constitution. Our constitution they're standing up to support. They're standing up to support our electoral system. They're standing up to support our laws. This is this is um, laudable that you have the international community standing up to defend our uh, standing up on the side of the Guyanese people mm -hmm. to defend their fundamental. This is a very fundamental right. When when Priya. Uh, and, and Gail went to the ambassador's house. They were not fighting them down because they were not defending these rights and so forth. We would never. Mm -hmm. The PVP Civic has always been seeking international and regional support in order because we we know that Guyana has great potential that we can have make a big contribution to the development in internationally. But at the same time. We could be a great embarrassment and we could be a drag on the region and on the international community if we do not do things in a democratic way. And with all the criticism that you, whatever criticism people have against the PVP state government, they cannot accuse us of being undemocratic. And if I may, uh, one other question. What would uh, uh, Donald Ramatar, who some would have viewed uh, conceded with grace, say to David Granger, uh, uh, at this point in time, could he walk away also uh, with some level of um, respect uh, after all that would have occurred after March second? Well, I think that he, he would have been he would have been in a far better position if he had done these things earlier. But I still think there is a window, a small window for him that he can stand up and put an end to this thing. He himself is seeing the harm. I don't know if he's seeing it. I, I, I um, he's not a, he's not a, he's an intelligent man, and he must be recognizing the damage that this is doing to our country. He must be recognizing the harm that is taking place. He must know about our case that we have on the 30th of June with Venezuela. Why is he endangering us? He must know that he lost the election. That's a fundamental thing. I don't think that I lost the election, but I didn't. I couldn't put my country uh, in danger and put people against each other and all of that. But he has clearly lost an election. 
they have you know, lost an election. I, I think I would say to him, save some dignity and think about the people of this country. Think mm -hmm. about the welfare of the masses of Guyana. And the road that you're presently on, if you continue on that road, I don't think you will succeed anyhow, but even if you do for, for any period of time, you are driving us into poverty and oppression and shame and disgrace. Mm -hmm. The best thing that you could do right now is to concede and walk away with some of your own personal dignity. Well, that yes, seems what I would say. Yeah. That seems to be in short supply for many of the persons who currently walk the corridors of power. Indeed, honesty, integrity, and dignity seems to be totally lacking from the persons who currently walk the power, the corridors of power. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you we are talking tonight to former President Donald Ramatar, who has kindly agreed to discuss some of uh, what would have transpired during his term in office and you know what comparisons we have seen from the 1980s of the years of the deadly rigged elections and 70s and 60s to what is happening now because mind you granger now president of guyana was in the burnham's party the pnc in the 1970s and 1980s and you know so some a lot well, of these players were very important leader of the army when when the election was rigged Massively, and the, uh, and, and the army was misused to seize ball boxes. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the other things, viewers and listeners, and Leonard, that I want to point out, I've noticed a, a, what I felt is a very good comment on social media that I want to share with everyone. Um, Mr. Vincent Alexander, a little while back in room 592, Leonard, he took credit. He said that it was because of his intervention certain things did not was not allowed uh, to have taken place uh, in a previous election how uh, and that he thwarted what he saw an error was an error in the then chief elections officer fast forward to 2020 the chief elections officer is doing his own thing and he's saying nobody can stop him um so, so it isn't it a strange thing that it's the same party, mind you, uh, Alexander, and they are not, they didn't turn up to the last meeting to even listen or to take the report, but the same persons would have said, well, they thwarted what appeared to be an attempt the last time. I, I just, I, I'm glad you raised that point, uh, Yog, because I've seen um, this man, Lewin Seahill, making a statement and saying that, uh, they, that he's not insubordinate. In, in his action, he's more than the Constitution is very, very clear that he has to take the directions of the uh, of the, the commission. He has to take he 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 is he is not the boss of the chairman of the elections commission. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. Correct. And, the, yeah? and, and, the, and there are many clauses in our Constitution. Um, the PPP had made a statement tonight, where which I think was a very good statement pointing out to the clauses in the Constitution mm -hmm. that showing where this man is violating, he's putting himself above the Constitution. This mm -hmm. man is, this man is, is, um, is viol not only violating the Constitution, what he's doing is illegal and well, criminal. Well, I will add this for your contemplation comment, sir. Um, Lowenfield today in his release he said, among many things, including what you said just now, he said that he acted in conformity with the laws. And yeah. the question that I have for him, Mr. Lowenfield, Major Lowenfield, if you're listening, can you clarify which one of your actions was in conformity with the laws? You made a, dec you made a report using Mingo's declaration. You made another report last week in which you gave the PNC two thirds, you made another report to the commission, the first, the preliminary report to the commission, in which you gave the commission the entire recount results, and then you made another report today, uh, well, day before yesterday, sorry, in which you are now giving up no win. So in which one of those reports have you acted in conformity with the law? Uh, Leonard, something is very strange here, and, and to you, Mr. Donald Ramatar, What's your thoughts to this, sir? 
When I, I mentioned just now, look, let me read to you what the law says, Section 18 of the Election Law Amendment Act 2008. The Chief Election Officer and the Commissioner of Registration shall notwithstanding anything in any written law be subject to the direction and control of the commission. So he's not a free agent, as he's, he, he, he's mm -hmm. trying to say. He is under the direction. And, and what he did, his actions what, that he did today, is, 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 um, is total insubordination. He should be, I mean, if he was working in the private sector, uh, they, he would have been fired immediately. Well, he claims to have a constitutional office. He claims to have a constitutional office, which I found to be quite absurd. Um, additionally, uh, let me mention this. Uh, additional, I think all, all of these statements are, are found in the, which is, I said, a very, mm -hmm. very good statement that it will be made um, this afternoon. And, um, but, and, they, and they quote the law here this, and the sections of the law to show that this man is acting in, in, in total violation of our constitution uh, um so it is very very the, the constitution is is very clear pellucid on uh, on low and field's role and the role of the commission mm -hmm. okay mr ramatar where do you as a former president um are you suspicious that there are more cards that will be played or or do you see that uh, this thing can come to an end very quickly or will not can of course it can but will it um i think i i would say that i would hope that um that common sense prevails and 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 the um the, the ruling that could be made by the caribbean court of justice and also by the election commission would be adhered to. Um, failing that, and we're in a totally new situation in this country where we have uh, an undisguised dictatorship, and that is calling for another another type of struggle that would be on mm -hmm. But and I am confident. What I can tell you, I have every confidence that the will of our people will triumph. Sir, um, given the, I hate to put you in this spot, but uh, as an experienced politician and currently uh, a related uh, observer, because you're still a member uh, of the executive of the PPP, mm -hmm. um, do you think that there is a likelihood that a declaration could be made, but the incumbent will refuse to step down? Well, as I said, nothing surprised me. By, by what they do, but I think that they have they should think very very clearly of the consequences. Uh, not only is the vast majority of Guyanese people, and not only not only the PVP supporters, but many of the PNC supporters probably who voted for them, will not agree that they want to live in in in, in a situation like this. They many of them I will say that they will not be in agreement. So the 15,000 votes that the PVP beat them by on, in the election will turn into hundreds of thousands more because I believe I have faith in the, in, the, um, in the collective intelligence of the Guyanese people. So I think it will, it will be even stronger. Secondly, the, the PNC has no support this government, this coalition has no support in our region. They have no support internationally. And they are very, very clearly going to be in a, uh, if they try to take, if they are mad enough to take such steps, that the, the consequences could be extremely severe of them. They can face penalties, they can face sanctions. It could be, uh, it, it could be devastating. And the current situation, though, sir, where the people of Guyana is concerned, what message does Mr. Donald Ramatar, as a former president, still active politician, because you still give advice to your party, and you're still in the executive, what advice you have to the frustrated Guyanese that feel that they're being strangled presently? What will you say? I would say, first of all, that, I, that they, 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 some of the feelings that they feel, 
really frustration and so forth. It's quite understandable. And it would be, they will be less than humans if they did feel some level of frustration because, because of what, of the behavior of this command, what they're doing, doing to our country. They're, they're dragging us, they're making us a laugh. It's stuck to some, to some extent, some of the things that they're doing. From, from the time they of the confidence motion, the they, they famous 34 and 33, which is, which is the majority of 65, mm -hmm. all of those things are, are, have done a lot of harm to our prestige and to our people. So I would say to them that we are very close. In my view, in my considered view, we are very, very close to bringing all of the shenanigans to an end when we can focus our energy on construction on the development of lifting people out of poverty, of creating employment for people, of carrying our country forward to allow it to realize its full full potential. That is what I would I would say that I have I am optimistic and I want to urge them to also be optimistic and to be confident that this long night is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to wrap up our program. And my next, uh, you know, my parting <clears throat> question to Mr. Ramatar, former President Donald Ramatar, would be, and sir, I will give you a moment to, to answer this question, uh, but the question will be, what does former President Donald Ramatar say to current de facto President David Granger? But I'll come to you in a minute to answer that, sir. Um, I would really like to, you to give your sage, uh, as an elder statesman, your advice. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you, uh, Guyana, as we know it, the political situation indeed is taking some twists and turns. It is weekend. Today is Friday. And, you know, from Leonard Gildari and Kaito Radio and yours truly, we do hope you have a great weekend. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, the truth about the strength of Guyanese resides not within the hands of the politicians, but resides within your hands, the people of this country. And in saying that, my appeal to you is that continue to ignore the racism, continue to ignore the personal attacks. Try to concentrate and remain focused on the issues. And the issues are as plain as day that the current set of politicians continue to attempt to rig these elections and they continue to attempt to stay in power, even though the electorate kicked them out on March 2nd. And with each passing day, they're spending your money, taxpayers' money, to make themselves look good, feel good. And they are, con they are entering into contracts that will really mess this country up when the new government is sworn in. Mr. Ramatar, your words to David Granger. And before he goes, you have just a quick question, maybe. Are we going to see a Mr. Ramatar uh, being part of a PVP government? Um, put it this way, I'm not looking for work. <laughs> I'm not looking for but, but I am always available to my party if the, if, if, if the, I, will, I want to discover, I want the PVP civic government to succeed because I want Guyana to succeed. And if they feel that there's anything that, um, that I could do, to help, I will be willing to help. I will be willing to do as as much as I can to see the people of this country realize their dreams. Uh, mm -hmm. And to come to your question, so, you, yes, what would you say to I current President that, uh, David? Uh, I would tell him that our country is suffering a lot. People are hurting. Uh, many people right across the board in this country they are hurting. Businesses are hurting. The working people of this country are suffering tremendously. And it has a direct link to the political situation that exists in Guyana today. And he can play a, a, a very important role by conceding that the APNU AFC, that they have lost the election, and let us have a civilized and peaceful transition to and have a, a developed country. And we let us try, as you mentioned, Joe, let us 
let us, as the PPP has always been doing, um, try to keep the debate on issues, on policies and issues, and things that will help our country to grow, and not only for our country to grow, but for our people to grow culturally and intellectually as well in civilized and honest debate. And, and I would urge uh, the de facto president, Mr. Granger, to think about that and think about the harm that is being done to the country by the resistance that they're putting up in the face of everyone pointing that the fact that they've lost the election and urging you to go on the side of democracy and country. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, former President Mr. Donald Ramatar. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have Mr. Ramatar with us tonight to relive some of the, the lessons and to, of course, give his own thoughts about what is happening with these elections that are being rigged in Guyana. As we know, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of, a lot of uh, institutions, a lot of uh, religious and social bodies are calling on Mr. Granger to concede. He can, of course, put everything to a quick end, put all his agony to a quick end by conceding. Um, however, he continues to hold on to power, and we certainly pray for the good health of all of our leaders in Guyana. And Leonard Gildari, the Center for Interreligious Dialogue, has just sent me a, a note, too, that they continue to pray for the health of um, all the leaders in Guyana, but they continue to ask that Mr. Donna, Mr. Here you go, I call your name, sir. <laughs> Mr. David Granger, um, do the right thing and concede and let Guyana move on. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have you all in room 592 and along with my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari, as we wish you to have a great weekend. I want to remind Kevin Smith. Kevin, I'm giving you back a minute of the night. And so we're going to make that up, my brother. Uh, Pres former President Ramatar, thank you so much for being with us tonight, sir. Uh, Leonard thank Gildari. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you. I um, take the opportunity to extend my best regard to all your viewers both and I, I i've noticed that you have um you, sometimes i hear you you're calling people in hong kong and all over so yes i, ex yeah. I send my greetings to all of you thank you <laughs> thank you leonard gildari what's the plan for the weekend my friend i have absolutely no idea i think you need a break i heard your voice <laughs> cracking up today um i think you need some rest but guess what the people are waiting so we'd have to see what develops we could Let probably see you tomorrow, and um, of course, we could probably ask uh, the President, uh, Donald Ramatari, to come back again, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, anytime, all... anytime I'll be willing to come. Thank you. Thank you. And viewers and listeners all across Guyana, I know many of you uh, are connected via uh, radio, and so we don't necessarily see you online, but please know that we know that you are listening to us. And we do hope that we can all, I encourage everybody to continue to do a prayer for Guyana and continue to live a wonderful life without hate. We must, we must fight against the wrong things, but not have any personal hate. So ladies and gentlemen from Room 592, we wish stay positive, stay safe, do your prayers. And I'm sure that the, the right thing will eventually and hopefully very quickly happen for one and all. Let's say thanks to Kevin Smith. Joshua Van Sleitman, the entire Kaito Radio, Raj, and all of you guys working hard behind the scenes to make this program a success. And thanks to Glenn Lal and the owners of Kaito Radio for making this program free, available to the Guyanese public and our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful weekend and have a wonderful Friday night. Goodbye now. Thank you. Up here, I'll come.